Hello, and today I'm reviewing Hardwired by Walter John Williams, a 1986 novel that leans a little on Zelazny's Damnation Alley, which is also reviewed on this channel, and it was one of the influences behind the cyberpunk movement of the late 1980s and early 1990s. Now, I picked this book up because it was so influential and because it was mentioned in a great YouTube video, hopefully that I've remembered to link below, on the genesis of the cyberpunk genre. For me, the video is a real treat, but the book, despite its significance, is perhaps something of a mixed bag, and drawing so much on a text from the 1960s, but also ushering in a genre very much in its infancy, perhaps that shouldn't be too much of a surprise. The story takes place in the near future, a world where multinationals have set up in orbit and then fought a rock war with the terrestrial governments. The execution of that war owes a little to Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. That debt, by the way, is not acknowledged alongside the one paid to Zelazny, nor is it the only one owed Heinlein. I counted three in the first 50 pages, but against the Zelazny backdrop, we have Sarah, a dirt girl, paying the way for herself and her deadbeat brother with a little whoring, a little mercenary work, and a bit of assassination on the side. Meanwhile, Cowboy, a panzer boy, makes his living driving an armoured hovercraft, the panzer is epithet, um, and smuggles black market goods from one side of the country to the other. As with Damnation Alley, the goods often take the form of, of uh, medicine to counter the cure for a disease that plays too little part in the book, really, for the ending to truly work. While Cowboy claims he's only in it for the ride, not the cargo, after his first run, the book's clear highlight, it is obvious that he's more involved than that. The black marketeers financing his craft are unlikely to approve either of his sudden shift in priorities, especially if, as he suspects, they are in the pay of the orbital multinationals anyway. But because the pandemic doesn't play a huge part in the novel, the destruction of the delivery of the antidote from orbit by Cowboy & Co doesn't seem like it would really play as much havoc with multinationals as Williams tells us that it does. Additionally, if he did play up the significance of the disease, then the destruction of the cure by our heroes would move them rather towards the villain camp, wouldn't it? Either way, the story is okay, the characters are strong enough, but the book peaks so hugely with Cowboy's early run across the state borders that it definitely seems to drag a touch afterwards. The final aerial combat raises the temperature again, but the book seems to sag just a little between these two set pieces. As with Molly and Case in New Romancer, our two leads hop into bed too soon, and their f buddies to Lover's Journey is a bit of a damp squib, and if it had just stayed a bit longer in the will they won't they phase, then it might have elevated the sluggish middle section just a touch. Sarah's deadbeat brother is a more interesting bag, and his use of puberty blockers to appeal to his perverted clientele is interesting for being way ahead of its time. It's also interesting that Williams' list of things in the book that came true didn't include that. The only real issue with Duad to the brother is that he's such a deadbeat that his final involvement in the plot is utterly predictable, and for all her street smarts, it reflects rather badly on Sarah that she puts the rebel group in such danger so easily for so little. The world building here as well is a touch awkward. We get scant detail of the world, and I found myself googling if I was reading a sequel or not. Williams himself suggests that this novel takes place in Zelazny's world, but that isn't completely obvious. Damnation Alley was far more clear in its setup. Hardwired starts with Cowboy thinking about the war, but with scant detail about who, what, where, why, or how, or what comes after the war itself, the world seems far more intact than the opening suggests. And as we get mentions of busy freeway cities, functioning hospitals and police, as well as the huge mansions of the wealthy, but all that is handed out piecemeal, making it hard to try and shape the look of this world in your head, and that job is one prone to later contradiction from the author anyway. We can see that in the adverts embedded in the text. Tampa's totals overnight, as of 8 this morning, 22 found dead within the city limits. Lucky when it's collected odds of 18 to 1, police deny charges of fixing. But we don't ever know how damaged Tampa was in the war, what has survived or been rebuilt afterwards, nor do we know the causes of the deaths here. We get one of these inserted after one of the violent scenes which suggests that they are including violent deaths but does it also include the deaths from the pandemic as well because it seems pretty low given those two considerations so is it suggestive of a collapse in society the lottery on deaths then is quite grisly but if temple was bombed flat and is now home to a few thousand people then 22 is really really high but if it survived mostly intact it might seem quite low because we don't know what's included in these deaths when they're totaled hardwired 
also lacks a decent antagonist. Cunningham, who hires Sarah in the early going and then turns against her, is almost completely absent from what transpires, leaving his work to hired underlings, the most memorable of which is the cycling child assassin who is killed off far too quickly for a character with such a chilling contradiction between look and action. Huge potential there, not realised. The book's most odious character, the, the child abusing former CEO of one of the multinationals, Albrecht Rune, is the one they ally with and try to oust a man that we don't even meet in this novel. Cowboy kills his ex-boss, very much a middleman, halfway through the novel with disappointing ease. Williams also narrates in the present tense, another interesting choice, and while the novel has a decent pace to it, his verbose style perhaps slightly undercuts the extra potential urgency that that stylistic choice offers. This extract from page two summarizes his style well enough. Some massive white castle in the Moroccan style, the playhouse of a long vanished Arab, its crumbling minarets streaked with brown, its rococo iron grillwork scored with advancing rust. Suddenly around a curve, a pair of ghosts appear like figures of supernatural warning, Indian pilgrims dressed in white, from the cloth binding their foreheads and braiding their long hair to the white doeskin moccasins that wink with silver buttons. Now, in amongst that adjective, soup, does this suddenly really come with any sense of the sudden? I think that Williams knew that his style didn't really lend itself to pulse-pounding urgency, and we can see him trying to engineer a rising action against his own inertial content when the first 200 pages contain 12 chapters and the last 100 contains 20. And while the big action scenes mostly work well, Williams writes in a way that seems more like a dreamy wafting through this world rather than the hard mechanical clanking that you might expect given the hypertech on display. As you can see in this paragraph that I've taken from the final battle scene where Cowboy's flying the Delta here against a surprisingly small fleet sent by the orbitals. The frigate tries to follow the nimble Delta but can't overshooting, but a missile pulls harder G's and Cowboy, with his burned rear sensors, hasn't seen it. It runs up one of his twin Rolls-Royce engines and suddenly Pony Express is unstable again, venting droplets of molten alloy as it slews across the sky. Cowboy's mind adjusts control surfaces, fuel flows, balances. Fury explodes in him. He looks for the target and finds it, hauling Pony Express in a tight S-turn to head straight for the frigate and knock it bodily out of the sky. But with one engine gone, the Delta has lost its acceleration and Cowboy can't catch the orbital frigate. Another laser lances into Pony Express from behind, the crippling frigate coming on for the kill. Now in this section you can see the adjectives highlighted are still fairly common. The verbs in bold are really piling up to try and generate pace. And they're doing it okay, but they have a lot of chaff to fight against. You can read this without the adjectives or the adjective phrases where appropriate without losing that much. Though when you do, it rather exposes the mediocrity of the verbs in use. Looks, finds, runs, pulls, all have synonyms which could better express the desperation of a life or death struggle. I think overall, it's a good microcosm of the novel itself. It thinks it's racing like one Nijinsky and dancing like the other. And it is, but it's got them the wrong way round. However, if you consider the drifting, often melancholy tone as somewhat dreamlike, then it is another interesting part of the novel, given that Williams claims that this story actually evolved out of a nightmare. But if the ultraviolence never really shakes off that stylistic meandering, Williams usually stays on the right side of engaging, and you can't deny that he's helped in part by his flowery style when he drops a simile like this one when Cowboy starts up his panzer engines. The beast roars like the last lonely dinosaur and trembles as it gains way. In conclusion, Hardwired holds the interest despite its quirky delivery, or perhaps because of it, because it's hard to know what's around the corner in a world that you know so little about. But balance that with the extraordinarily detailed description of Reno's house when Cowboy visits uh, about halfway through, and is that completely congruous with the lack of detail felt elsewhere? Probably not. Cowboys barnstorming across the states, his blazing guns and roaring engines are, if anything, a cut above their source material. And maintaining that energy through the entire novel would have made this something of a classic. Instead, we get a drop in energy that rather inverts the expected rising action of a second act, and we get, instead, a supremely stylish but somewhat untidy and disjointed novel, bigger on influence than its influences. If you like Zelazny's effort, then you'll like the parts of this novel that are the closest to that one. William's style, however, is far more wordy, and despite that, his world is actually less realised. Neuromancer relied more heavily on its position in cyberpunk canon for its recommendation than Hardwired does. The strength and power of Hardwired's action-packed set pieces and a more interesting mix of environments and characters make this a very suitable use of your time and money. Neuromancer exists in a more identifiable cyberpunk world, but Hardwired is a more enjoyable read. Thank you for watching. 
If you like this, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.